In the states that comprise modern Germany, the 19th century saw the construction of numerous museum buildings for the purpose of showing collections created by members of the bourgeoisie. These bourgeois museums differed in their purposes from museums that held collections belonging to the nobles. The roots of these differences lay in the divergent context of the collections institution. The collections held by noble and princely collections, a dynasty, sorry, usually took shape over a period of generations. A bourgeois museum, by contrast, often came into being at the instigation of a society or association like the fine art societies in German Kunstvereine or of an individual benefactor like Johann Friedrich Stedl in Frankfurt am Main and Ferdinand Franz Wallraff in Cologne. The art associations or donors get their collections to a city or the state with the condition that they were open in the public. These collections were often small when the museum was founded. In many cases, further endowments then followed and the collections in the museums grew as happened in the Hanseatic cities of Hamburg and Bremen. In numerous other instances, as in Frankfurt am Main, the endowment funds served the collections augmentation. Furthermore, the bourgeois collection differ from the aristocratic collections in the focus of their collections. The bourgeois collections that were transferred to museums often consisted of works from the 18th and 19th centuries. They included contemporary art and a very old masters before 1800. Due to the constant growth of the collections through new donations, gifts and acquisitions, the collections holding in the bourgeois museums were also very heterogeneous and generally without any specific thematic foci. Alongside this aspect stands the didactic intention behind many of these museums, which frequently called for the creation of particular types of spaces. All these factors had a decisive influence on the museum's construction and design, particularly in relation to the number and arrangement of the rooms and spaces within and the iconographic program used externally and internally. I will now illustrate these factors using the examples of the Städel Museum in Frankfurt am Main and the Kunsthalle in Hamburg. In so doing, I hope to eliminate the specific characteristics of museums that emerged on the basis of collection created by members of the bourgeoisie. In his will of 1815, Johann Friedrich Städel donated his collection for the establishment of an art institute in Frankfurt am Main. The Institute received the dual task of maintaining a public collection of art and supporting the training of emerging artists. Initially, the collection was housed in Stedel's former residence on Rossmarkt before moving in 1833 to the Estuel Postmaster's Villa in Neue Mainzer Straße. Alongside a picture gallery and collections of casts, prints, and drawings, the building housed the School of Art and Library. In 1878, the Städel Institute took up residence in a bespoke building constructed by Oskar Sommer at Schaumannkeim. There were separate buildings from the museums and the School of Art. By the time it found its purpose-built home, Johann Friedrich Städel's original collection had been through a number of changes to its focal emphasis. Städel's bequest had, uh, had comprised a total of 478 paintings. 404 of these were sold. The proceeds used to fund the acquisition of other pieces deemed of higher quality and greater significance. Under its first director, the artist Philip Feit, who had a close association with the Nazarene movement of German romantics, the Städel acquisitions showed the preponderance of religious works of the Italian Quattrocento and Cinquecento and paintings by the early Dutch artists. These purchases and core the collection's focus um, at the threshold of transition from the medieval art area to the Renaissance in Germany and Italy. This was a fact of which visitors were apprised as they entered the museum and saw the booths of Dürer and Raphael flanking the steps that led to the museum's first floor and three reception rooms. The purpose of these spaces was to prepare the public to meet and respond to the art in the collection. To this end, visitors first encounter was with the artistic ideal in the form of reproductions of Raphael's Vatican frescoes. 
The rooms adjoining these to the north containing the, uh, contained the museum's collection of sculptures. The gallery of painting was in the room to the south, the first of which showed 17th century Dutch and Flemish art. The second room showed so-called Alt Deutsche Meister, which included early German artists, but also early Netherlandish artists. The third room exhibited Italian pieces. In this way, this area of the museum juxtaposed and contrasted in special and artistic terms works from Germany and Italy. The wing facing the garden had a further room displaying Dutch and Flemish paintings, adjoining a contemporary art space, and itself leading to a third room with works by 18th century artists from Frankfurt. The final room was presumably intended to hold future acquisitions. Lying parallel to the first and second rooms in the wing was the fresco room, which from 1836 was home to Philip Pite's programmatic mural, the arts being introduced to Germany by Christianity. Here, uh, I would like to show you briefly the fantastic reconstruction of the Städel that it has made of various rooms. You can find it at the Städel homepage under the keyword Zeitreise. As documented in watercolors painted by Mary Ellen Best in uh, 1835, the exhibition rooms showcased the Nazarene movement's conception of art in the image decorating them. Portraits of canonical artists from the relevant areas adorned the walls spanning the rooms that held the so-called Altdeutsch or Old German and Italian collections. Albrecht Dürer and Jan van Eyck were depicted in the former, Raphael and Michelangelo in the latter. A similar visual representation of art history had been planned by Peter Cornelius for the Munich Spinakothek a few years earlier in 1825. Here, from 1830 to 1850, the cupolas above the loggia on the south side of the building were decorated with depictions of key events from the life of specific artists. Twelve cupolas contained scenes revolving around Italian artists, while a further twelve illustrated the development of fine art in Germany, France, and the Netherlands. The 13th central cupola was dedicated to Raphael. The exhibition rooms reprised and continued this theme. Some of the ceilings showed scenes from the lives of the artists whose work featured on the walls below. 24 sculptures of artists stood on the building outer balustrade above the loggia, rounding off the iconographic program. Raphael served as the embodiment of Italian's art heyday and apogee. As such, he was presented both in the Alte Pinakothek and in the Städel Institute in the Neue Mainzer Straße. Upon its opening in 1878, the new Städel Museum at Schaumann Kai the shift in the context placed around the collection, which had expanded further in the meantime. On its ground floor, you see it here, um, the sculpture collection um, in green occupied rooms to the right of the entrance hall, while the collection of prints and drawings and the library uh, red were on its left. The picture gallery was upstairs. Having expanded, the visitor entered an octagonal space topped by a cupola dedicated to the donor of the original endowment, Johann Friedrich Städel, whose booth stood on a niche um, opposite the stairs. The west wing, here green, housed works of art made prior 1800. The east wing, 19th century works in red. The only interruption to the collection's chronological presentation occurred in the room attached to the north and the south of the skylight rooms. The spaces to the north in blue um, exhibited German and Dutch art proceeding from west to east. The painting's arrangement was partly thematic and partly chronological. The galleries to the south, um, meanwhile, showed 19th century sketches, copper plates, and cartoons. We therefore observed that the Neustädel Museum, like the museums founded by territorial surveyors in Munich and Dresden, arranged the paintings in their collections according to the national base nationally based schools from which they had emerged. In this context, however, we note a fascinating change in the assessment evidently attached to these schools. The Neue Mainzer Straße Museum had presented its Italian Renaissance and the so-called All German Masters as its highlights, placing them into two adjoining rooms. 
image of these two schools' principal figures, Raphael and Dürer, had greeting visitors as they entered the building. At Schaumann-Kai, by contrast, the old masters found themselves placed in the west wing and their contemporary counterparts in the east wing. A shift in presentation and emphasis then was evident. Previously, there had been a just opposition and contrast between German and Italian art. Now, all German art was just opposed and contrasted with contemporary art. The outside of the building foreshadowed and retreated this new emphasis, featuring figures of Dürer and Holbein the Younger, each side of the entrance. In this alerted view of the relative significance of art, works from the institution's own country and time received higher esteem than had been, uh, that had been previously been the case. The sculptures that greeted visitors approaching the building and the manner of the collection's presentation inside appears as clearly visible statements of intent in this regard. Dürer and Holbein stood for the art of Germany as a nation, extending an invitation in the period immediately succeeded the German Reich Foundation in 1871 to identify with that new entity. The notable emphasis now placed on contemporary art likewise made itself plain in the exhibition spaces dedicated to these works on the same floor of the museum as older pieces, a novel development in this exhibiting of art. Dresden's picture gallery had placed works from different epochs and different stories, with Italian and Netherlandish art juxtaposed and contrasted on the first floor and contemporary art, and works considered of lower quality and the second. This placing of Italian and Netherlandish or Dutch art in contrast in two separate wings of the building was an approach opposed to that of Munich's Alte Pinakothek, where the consecutive arrangement of artists' schools thought to represent an evolutionary cause culminating in Italian art. The contemporary works found space in another building altogether, the Neue Pinakothek. The Städel's innovation of showing older and contemporary pieces on the same floor underlined the significance of the latter. Another unusual feature of the new Städel Museum was the original emphasis of its collection with two of its exhibition spaces in the north of the building devoted to 17th and 18th century painters from Frankfurt. This regional flavor to the collection appears to have become more distinct in the years that followed the new museum's opening. Other collections expanded likewise, particularly those of contemporary works. By 1900, all old masters belonging to the collection were to be found in the West Wing, with contemporary pieces claimed the entirety of the East Wing space, and Frankfurt-based artists from the 16th century shown to date in the building's two southern galleries. This meant that contemporary art and regional artists were now taking up substantially greater spaces in the museum. This change in the collection's arrangement appears to reflect the increased interest in contemporary and regional art that we find in analogous form in Hamburg's Kunsthalle, which I will now discuss. In 1817, Hamburg became the site of the first fine art society, Kunstverein, to come into being in the territories of today Germany. Subsequently, in 1848, this association proposed the establishment of a public collection of paintings, for which it provided a collection of 40 largely contemporary works. After lengthy negotiations, the Senate, Hamburg's governing body, agreed to fund the exhibition space. The Hamburgische Städtische Öffentliche Gemäldegalerie opened on March 13, 1850 in the city's Börsenarkaden. Further endowments and donations enabled the collection to expand repeatedly. As early as 1856, the museum lacked the space to exhibit all its holdings. In a process uh, lasting from 1863 to 1869, the architects Georg Theodor Schirnmacher and Hermann von der Hude built the Kunsthalle as a new home for the collection in a manner of facilitating further extension to the space as required. The first of these was built from 1885, um, four, sorry, to 1886, you see it here green. Subsequently, in a construction period from 1914 to 1919, the Kunsthalle acquired an annex. The arrangement of the collection in this new residence was along similar lines to that in Frankfurt Städels Institute. The ground floor housed the sculpture and copper plates collection alongside a space for the Kunstverein's permanent exhibition. The exhibition of paintings was on the first floor. 
The heterogeneous nature of the donations made to the collection initially prohibited the use of one specific criterion for the painting's arrangement. A situation complicated by the fact that some donors had given sets of works they intend to be shown in separate closed contexts within the museum. It was not until the tenure of Alfred Lichtwag, the first art specialist, to take the director's chair at the Kunsthalle that the rearrangement of the collection's holding took place in a more systematic collection, policy came onto the horizon. When Lichtwag took up his post, the Kunsthalle had a section of old masters, one of more recent masters with a subsection of English works, a collection of sculptures, another of coins, another of drawing and prints, and a library. During his time in office, Lichtwag focused on two aspects of collection development. The first was the systematic acquisition of 19th century paintings and contemporary art. The second was the conscious and deliberate creation of collections with a direct link to the city of Hamburg. This including works by artists from or working in the city, as well as pieces depicting scenes and subjects from Hamburg and its environs. In an analogous vein, Lichtberg collected Dutch paintings whose motives and themes tended to relate closely to Hamburg's Hanseatic identity. The underlying intention of this dual focus was educational. Lichtberg wished the collections to serve the artist edification of Hamburg's population, to which end he thought to purchase primarily modern works of high artistic quality. The purpose of the Hamburg theme collection was to lower the threshold for visitors' engagement with art by presenting them with paintings whose themes they would recognize from their everyday experience. The visitor should learn an understanding of art by comparing the Hamburg paintings with thematically or chronologically related paintings. Lichtwag wished to set up a museum of Hamburg that the city population would take to their hearts and visit in numbers. It is likely that he additionally thought by displaying works from Hamburg to arouse visitors' pride in the city-state and their associated identity. We can perceive the distinct marks of Lichtwag's endeavor in the first collection uh, catalog he issued. In 1901, the Kunsthalle ground floor housed alongside the cover plate and sculpture collections, the old masters which included the collection retracing the history of painting in Hamburg. This story also included room reserved for the Hattwerker Wesselhoff collection, donated for exhibition as a separate unit within the museum. By this time, the museum additionally had a library and reading room to bolster its educational mission. The first floor was home to the works by more recent masters, the collection of Hamburg-based 19th century masterworks, and the Schwabe collection, which consisted principally of pieces by English painters. On the second floor, two rooms had works from Hamburg in watercolor and pastel. The Kunsthalle's Hamburg collections then were already existing at this time. Divided into chronological and thematic sub-collections, they were dispersed throughout the building on its ground, first and second floor. After Lichtwag's death in 1914, his plans regarding the future arrangement and presentation of the Kunsthalle's collection found realization in the annex completed in 1919. The original building's ground floor served to exhibit paintings by Dutch artists and provided rooms for temporary exhibitions. The cover plate collections uh, went to the annex, which also contained rooms for public education and teaching, the library and reading rooms, and the photography uh, collection. 19th century works found a home in the upper floors of the, of, of the original building, and to an extent the annex which was largely dedicated to the Kunsthalle's various Hamburg theme collections and also hosted the sculpture collection. The Schwabe collection, presented as a separate entirety with the Kunsthalle, occupied the rooms in the original building southwest wing. As far as possible, the spatial arrangement of the collections sought to enable visitors to view each of them separately, without necessarily also seeing the others. Thematically linked collections, such as the Hamburg-related works, appeared in close proximity to one another. The arrangements in the Kunsthalle differed from the Städel Museum's chronologically contrasted presentation of old masters and modern works. The construction of the annex in Hamburg provides facilities to the continued subdivision of the collections in thematic terms, with collections compatible in this context placed, to, placed together. The Kunsthalle's original emphasis 
on Hamburg was an important factor here. I will now summarize uh, the observations I have made uh, during this talk. The art museums in Frankfurt and Hamburg that were founded on Boulevard's initiative served as starting points for the establishment of public collection of art. The repeat expansion, thanks to additional endowments and donations, gave rise to the construction of new museum buildings. The arrangement and presentation of the collection, though, reflected the specific characteristics that attached to their bourgeois provenance. Contemporary art was of, um, was of significance in this context. In Frankfurt Städel and Hamburg's Kunsthalle, the collections of contemporary art grew continuously and accordingly claimed more and more spaces as time passed. Another important feature of these bourgeois museums was the emerge of original folk key to their collections. Targeted acquisitions brought paintings by Frankfurt-based artists to the Städel. The Kunsthalle took the original emphasis a step further, collecting alongside art from Hamburg by artists of Hamburg, paintings whose theme was Hamburg itself. Each in their own way, these museums thought in displaying their own art to create for their visitors a sense of identification with their city, their state, or the German Reich. In this way, the centering of contemporary and regional art alongside endeavors to continuously expand collections and give them a distinct thematic flavor. This proceeded in the service of an emphatic strategy of public communications and education. Libraries and lecture rooms in the museum's building aided these efforts. Lectures and talk enabled museum staff to engage directly with visitors. The libraries invited those who came to the museums to expand their educational horizon and learn more about the works on shown and the context in which they had come into being. In this light, educational spaces were often the rigueur in museums whose purpose was exhibiting bourgeois collections. I hope with my talk today to have demonstrated the various differences between the manner in which bourgeois and princely museums in the 19th century German states displayed and, in the broader sense, framed their collection. Thank you for your attention. D during the fraught history of the two world wars, three museums in the Netherlands emerged as groundbreaking museums of modern art. Whether in their architecture, use of space, or collecting and exhibiting practices, the Kunstmuseum, former Gemeente Museum, Den Haag, um, the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, and the Kroller Museum in, in Otterlo supported new, new art museums and museum reform. These museums developed within the context of a larger early 20th century European and North American traje trajectory that saw national and universal museums of the past century give way to specialized museums devoted specifically to modern and contemporary art. Such breakaway museums, marked by a separation from the historical and patriotic narratives of their predecessors, focused on contemporary art by living artists and were often the result of collective or personal initiatives from the civil society, collectors, or societies of friends of the arts. Whether funded by the state, region, or city, these institutions reflected a new social dimension of the art world and an international as well as national or local reach. In the Netherlands, as in other European countries, such collecting enterprises garnered public interest, while the modern art movements and architecture they supported informed the aesthetic and social rise of the new museums. Often it was the buildings as well as the artworks that laid the ground, groundwork for a new way of looking at art. And in just a minute, I will get to images. Um, Although two of the museums in this study, the Kunstmuseum Den Haag and the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam were initially established in the 19th century as city museums with eclectic collections. In the 1930s, they aligned themselves with modern art and architecture in ways that had lasting significance. The third institution, the Kroller Muller Museum, which first opened in 1938 as a national institution, was the inspiration of one wealthy German born heiress, Helena Kroller Muller, one of the first European women to put together a private collection and public museum. Though all three museums promoted modern art and social reform, their founders and directors did so to varying degrees. Advocates of social reform, they were also often members of elite circles and ranged in their acceptance of new abstract forms. Moreover, some museums of 
some museum officials resisted the Nazi regime at great personal risk, while others collaborated with it. All faced enormous political and economic difficulties during the period of the two world wars. Yet in the end, these museums were transformative. Their social and artistic histories, along with inherent political contradictions, inform the con content of this paper, which represents the very early stages of a larger research project. The Stedelijk Museum Amsterdam opened on 14 September 1895 as an initiative of the local authority and private individuals. The Dutch neo-Renaissance style building designed by architect Adrian Willem Weissman was perhaps was part of a modernization project spearheaded by local citizens starting in 1850. Functioning initially as a Kunsthal for temporary displays of work by members of local artists association the Stedelijk Museum first began acquiring art in 1930. It accepted a large and important loan of Vincent van Gogh paintings in 1931, and its directors, uh, C.W.H. Bard and then David Royal, formerly of the Rijksmuseum, modernized their art, art galleries, painting them white to provide a neutral background for art and increasingly mounting exhibitions of international modern art even though this set up a tension between more conservative local artists and the contemporary avant-garde. Here you see the Stedelijk Museum today, and actually this addition, which was only added in 2012, was in homage to um, a, a director from the 1930s, uh, William Sandberg, who launched white, white galleries throughout the museum, and I'll talk about him more later. Um, in 19, and here, here I'll talk about him now, indeed. Um, in 1937, Roll hired graphic artist, nobleman, and leftist activist Willem Sandberg as curator. Sandberg had a long tenure at the Stedelijk Museum, rising to director in 1945 and remaining in that position until his retirement in 1962. Less interested in traditional art historical displays based on chronology, style, and theme, Sandberg promoted art to create a quote, living museum, unquote. His efforts coincided with the growing influence of Amsterdam's Socialist Party and its desire to connect the masses with the museum. Among his many initiatives, Sandberg introduced a design collection at the museum to stimulate the participation of industry and commerce and serve the public. In 1944, the city council accepted a focus on modern art for the Stedelijk Museum. Between the years 1940 and 1945, many Dutch museums were forced to close. However, the Stedelijk Museum remained open. An active member of the Dutch resistance, Sandberg and his director Roel purchased modern art from German artists and dealers forced to flee their homeland, staged small resistance exhibitions with patriotic themes such as city and country and quietly supported art uh, artists that refused to join the Kulturkammer, the Reich's Chamber of Culture. St Sandberg also created the first museum bunker in the Netherlands for safeguarding vulnerable collections of art, including those of Van Gogh's heirs, the royal family, and several Jewish collectors, as well as his museum and other Dutch institutions. Still under Ger German occupation, the Stedelijk Museum was forced to mount propaganda exhibitions and Sandberg because he forged identity documents of Jews and others, others wanted by the Gestapo and participated in the bombing of the Amsterdam Public Records Office went into hiding under a false name. During his time on the run, Sandberg created the Experimenta Typografica, a series of unique graphic design experiments that remain a highlight of the Stedelijk collections. Immediately after the war ended and two years after the artist's death in 1946, Sandberg hosted the exhibition Piet Mondrian, celebrating modern art's outright triumph over the Nazi regime. The painter Piet Mondrian, founder of the pathbreaking and influential art movement to style that promoted abstraction as an unchanging core of reality and spiritual vision had a long history with the Stedelijk Museum. 
In 1911, he co-organized the museum's first modern art circle, the Moderne Kunstring exhibition for avant-garde artists, where he saw the paintings of Cezanne and original Cubist works of art by George Brock and Pablo Picasso and decided to move to Paris where he began to work in an exclusively abstract manner, rejecting his earlier, more traditional figurative style. Visiting the Netherlands in 1914 and prevented from returning to Paris due to World War I, Mondrian stayed in the town of Laren, an art colony east of Amsterdam, where he further developed his abstract work. Mondrian supported himself with a stipend from the renowned and well-connected artist, journalist, and art consultant consultant Hank Bremer, who was also assisting Helena kroller Muller in building the collection that became her museum. In 1917, Mondrian, an artist and writer Theo van Dosberg, established the Museum de Style, and in 1919, after the war, Mondrian moved back to Paris. He lived there until 1938, when faced with the threat of war and Nazi condemnation of his work as degenerate, he moved first to London and then to New York where he died in 1944. This is the last work he made, Victory Boogie Woogie in 1944, um, which although the Stedelijk Museum wanted it, it is now in the collections of the Kunstmuseum Den Haag. Though engaged in the international art worlds of Paris and New York, Mondrian stayed connected to the Netherlands. Besides his early association with Hank Bremer, Mondrian maintained ties to estate agent and collector, uh, Salomon Sleiper, who purchased the, the, art, the artist's work and actively arranged for donations to the Stedelijk Museum. Mondrian's letters reveal anti-Semitic attitudes towards Sleiper, who was raised in the Jewish community of Amsterdam. But it was through Sleiper that Mondrian, himself half Jewish, explored the the possibility of creating a museum of just his works in the, work in the Netherlands. And it was Sleiper's sizable donation to the Kunstmuseum Den Haag um, that took place in 1971 of Mondrian's early work that established that Dutch museum as the world's, world's largest repository of Mondrian's work. Now we'll turn to the Kunstmuseum Den Haag. In 1919, the municipality of The Hague commissioned renowned architect, oh, this is Sleiper, I'm sorry. Um, in 1919, the municipality of The Hague commissioned renowned architect Hendrik Petrus Berlage, known for, among other projects, the Amsterdam Commodities Exchange and Plan Zoud, the social housing plan in Amsterdam, to design a museum that would house the modern works of the town's collection. Uh, this is where, this is the St. Sebastian's Guild in Den Haag, where the um, collections had been stored until uh, um, um, Berlage's new design. Um, the museum's director, Enno van Gelder, an archivist, uh, self-taught museologist, and committed socialist, had been acquainted with Berlage since the 1890s, when both men lived in Amsterdam and belonged to a group of socialist intellectuals. The two men, motiva motivated by the belief that a museum should be a place in which to enjoy exceptional works of art, not a storage facility, nor an opportunity for study, but rather an accessible institution in the service of the community, collaborated for over 15 years to realize their dream in The Hague. Berlage's first design for the museum was a grand utopian model of a cultural center, and you can see it on the left, although unfortunately it's not so readable. Um, but it was to be a grand utopian model of a cultural center that included a domed central hall flanked by two gallery spaces, one for modern painting and sculpture and the other for applied arts with a large pool in between, as well as auditorium, conference and other temporary exhibition spaces, spaces in back. Rejected by the municipality for its megalomaniac character, size, and cost, especially within the context of the interwar period, the project ran aground until 1927, when the city council approved a more modest plan for a building that would house paintings, sculpture, and decorative arts from 1800 forward. 
With the revised design from Berlage, construction for the new building began in 1931. This was to be Berlage's final masterpiece as he died the year before the museum was completed in 1935. Steeped in the historicist styles of the turn of the 20th century and influenced by American architects H. H. Richardson and later Frank Lloyd Wright, Berlage, Berlage nonetheless designed for a new era. Always concerned for the social consequences of his work, he intended for every detail to express social and artistic unity of will and focused on the way his buildings affected the behavior of their occupants. The distinctive and harmonious Kunstmuseum made with 11 centimeter yellow bricks whose color reflects the surrounding environment was no exception. Using modern color schemes and light on the interiors and removing anything that would detract from the artworks themselves, Berlage gave greater consideration to circulation patterns in his museum than any other Dutch museum had before. Although the exterior of the building, which lacked the more customary marble and granite of 19th century museums, at first struck many as quote, messy, unquote, as, quote, more reminiscent of a factory complex than the monumental art temple they had expected, unquote. The intimacy and careful lighting of the spaces inside elicited a calm visibility that won people over as perhaps more valuable than the grandeur found in, in other museums. Um, so this is the entrance hall, and this is actually a, re a monumental relief carving that was created um, and finished after the opening by Willem uh, von Koninenberg. Um, and it is actually his version of a Madonna image with angels at the top representing the variety of art forms uh, that the museum displayed with a background of the museum behind her and below. Um, uh, worshippers, uh, worshippers of art, and um, the um, quote inscribed in the wall relief uh, said, honor the divine light in the revelations of art. It's just ironic that this was placed here um, within um, Berlage's unifying um, museum because the artist um, allied himself with the um, at pretty much at the same time that this was placed on, on the wall. Um, attention to modern display was also of paramount concern to Piet Mondrian. Although the Kunstmuseum was not necessarily designed as a showcase for the De Style movement, Berlage influenced its establishment and the works did find a place in the museum's earliest displays, albeit in an unconventional manner. Mondrian's painting composition with four yellow lines, a picture that suggests a square we do not actually see in full, um, although shown here um, on, on an easel in the, in the artist's Paris studio, was presented to the Kunstmuseum by Dutch artist Charlie Turup. Because it was unclear how to incorporate the work within the museum's new painting galleries, it was instead hung together with abstract canvases by Theo van Dosberg, Bart van der Leck, and other de style artists in one of the stairwells, where it was perceived to be better, it, where it was perceived to better enter a dialogue with the architecture. Art historian Michael White, in his book, De Style and Dutch Modernism, argues that De Style artists, while promoting abstract and autonomous works of art, nevertheless sought to unite abstraction with common culture and thus advance the social implications of art. They did this by having a say over the way their artworks were hung, thus demonstrating an interaction with painting and architecture and the concept of Gemeinschaft Kunst or community art even as in the cases of the Kunstmuseum and the Stedelijk, where the walls were painted, were painted white. Some 45 years later in the 1980s, it's interesting to note that conceptual American artists saw LeWitt as a kind of homage to Mondrian and Berlage, installed one of his own wall paintings on a Kunstmuseum staircase. During World War II, the Kunstmuseum Den Haag noted, located near the Atlantic Wall, a coastal defense system built near Scavenhagen Beach by the Germans, closed and was used as a repository by the occupying Nazis. 
From 1942 to 1945, Gerhardus Nuttel, the museum's chief curator of modern art, who succeeded Van Gelder as director of the Kunstmuseum, was imprisoned with other intellectual hostage, hostages in the St. Saint, Saint Gestel camp for refusing to cooperate with the Nazis during the occupation. After the war, he resumed his directorship at the Gemeinst Museum or Kunstmuseum, and after repairs, the museum reopened to the, to the public in 1946. And now I will go to the Kruller Muse Muller Museum. In 1935, the same year that the Kunstmuseum Den Haag opened, Helena Kruller Muse Muller and her shipping and mining tycoon husband, Anton Kruller, donated their large collection of mostly 19th and early 20th century modern European art, including the world's second largest number of works by Vincent van Gogh to the Dutch people. The Rijksmuseum Kruller Muller, established in a purpose-built building designed by Belgian architect Henry van de Velde, opened in Otterloo in 1938 in the remote Heathland area of what is today the Hoge Velu National Park in the Eastern Netherlands. Today called the Kroller Muller Museum, it represents one of the world's first museums of modern art. The Kroller Mullers made their home in Vassenaar, an affluent suburb next to The Hague, and Helena first displayed her collections there. Helena began collecting through her association with Hank Bremer, mentioned previously in association with Piet Mondrian, and these are the, the kind of, this is Helena Kroller Muller in the museum um, in the center of these slides. And these are the variety of men who aided her in all of her, um, from her architecture to her uh, collecting to her husband, um, et cetera, in, in terms of his uh, financial acumen. Um, um, so she began collecting through her association with Bremer, mentioned previously in association with Mondrian, with whom she first took classes in art appreciation and was ultimately encouraged to purchase art. Taught by Bremer that art was fundamentally that which provides a spiritual experience, Kroller Miller was inspired to collect works by Van Gogh, who Bremer also promoted. Helena fo followed the maxim that quote, the spiritual and material worlds are one, unquote. A devotee of modern art, she nonetheless straddled the tension between realism and abstraction and often tried to find moderation in these two opposites, ultimately believing there had to be some references to actual life in art. Aided by the business acumen of her husband, as well as the education of Bremer, Helena collected avidly from about 1908 to 1928, when she made her last spectacular purchase of 100 Van Gogh drawings from the Hilde Nyland collection, just as the family business suffered grave financial difficulties caused by massive debts. The Kroller Mullers had long considered plans for creating a freak standing museum to be located on the grounds of their Otterloo estate. And in 1919, enlisted H.B. Berlage, who had already completed the St. Hubertus hunting lodge for them. Berlage and Helena, however, did not get along and Berlage resigned from his position with the Kroller Mullers as soon as he received the commission for the Kunstmuseum Den Haag. The Kroller Mullers then hired Belgian architect Henry van de Velde. Van de Velde himself had a strong pedigree. He had designed and was the first director of the School for Applied Arts in Weimar, which ultimately integrated with the Bauhaus School and designed the interior of the Folkwang Museum in Hagen, Germany, which became one of the most important centers of international modernism in Central Europe. In 1926, he, he submitted over 1,000 drawings for the Kroller Muller's Grand Museum, although eventually, like the Kunstmuseum Den Haag, the plans were scaled down due to cost. And this was the ultimate realization of the Kroller Muller Museum. The Kroller Muller's idea to donate their collection to the state was motivated by the newly dire financial circumstances of the family, but it was nonetheless a fitting choice with how Helena Kroller Muller valued her collection, wanting to share it with as large a population as possible, 
even though until World War II, the state was not a very important factor in the recognition of modern art. Helena Kroller Muller lived to see her museum open in 1938, but died a year, um, and this is the opening of it, um, but died a year later where her coffin was placed in front of her beloved painting, Four Withered Sun Sunflowers by Vincent van Gogh. Like the Stedelijk Museum, the Kroller Muller Museum also remained open during mm -hmm. Nazi occupation, but for a very short time due to aerial bombing in the vicinity. But unlike the Stedelijk Museum, the Kroller Muller Museum had direct interaction with the German forces. In 1940, Nazi Reichskommissar Arthur Seyss Inquart approached Sam von Deventer, longtime confidant of Helena Kroller Muller and future director of the museum, to request a purchase of three paintings by German artists, including a Venus with Amor the Honey Thief by famed Renaissance painter Louis, Lucas Cranach. Um, but although the Reichskommissar claimed these paintings had to be relinquished under the guise of repatriation or Rückführung, because they possessed such a, such a great emotional value for Germany, they were in fact intended for the art collections of, of Hitler and Goering. Von de Venter and Anton Kroller, by now the widow, widower of Helena, agreed to this offer, which gave them a significant sum of 600,000 guilders, which they placed in a fund for the acquisition of new works of art. Over the next six years, Van de Venter purchased 20 works of modern French and Dutch art with these funds, two of which were returned after the war because they came from Jewish owned collections stolen by the Germans. Van de Venter and Kroller negotiated further with the Nazis for additional compensation that in turn allowed the German military to use the national park on which the museum stood as an airfield. The Nazis built a bomb shelter for the Kroller Muller Museum to store its art. Um, immediately after the war, uh, when the museum was functioning as a civilian hospital, Von de Venter was arrested for collaborating with the Nazis and removing three paintings from the national collection. Still, the Kroller Muller Museum reopened in 1946 when the new acting director, Willy Aupang, with the help of an allied Canadian lieutenant, recovered the museum's artworks and subsequently managed to purchase one of the most important Van Gogh paintings in the museum's collection, an oil sketch for the potato eaters. Here are some conclusions. Based on the brief histories of the, these three museums during the turbulent war years, it is increasingly clear that to gain a clearer understanding of their significant, significant challenges, avant-garde activities, and ultimate contributions to the formation of a new museum type, that a study of their post-war activities must also be made. In 1920s and 30s Europe, the focus shifted away from collectors and dealers to museums to determine the course of modern art history. Artists and architects produced their work in and for these museums, but amidst the dangerous challenges of oppressive regimes. However, unlike Germany, and I might add unlike Italy as well, the Netherlands could keep their museums of modern art open, albeit managing their acquisitions and display under the menacing eyes of the Nazi culture camera. Even if closed during Nazi occupation, however, all of, all of these museums acquired art uh, during wartime. They conducted business with the same Dutch dealers and in some cases purchased different lots from the same collection. The result of the Dutch Museum Association project called Museum Acquisitions from 1933 onwards, some of these purchases, purchases are now under investigation for their questionable provenance having been looted or forced to sales from Jewish collectors. Some cases remain unresolved because the museums do not have accurate or thorough acquisition records from the Second World War period. In other cases, as with Willem Sandberg at the Stedelijk Museum, artworks from Jewish collectors were deliberately neglected in terms of record keeping to provide what, what was considered camouflaged safekeeping. Amidst a very difficult political environment, museums of modern art in the Netherlands created new meanings and values that would take the place of 19th century historicist monumentality and local or national sentiment. But in so doing, they were equivocal. 
participating in hard suffering political resistance or collaboration with Nazi socialists. By continuing this study of Netherlands Museums of Modern Art in the post-war years, as well as the, the interwar years, I hope to explore the question of what museological progress meant in the early 20th century and contribute to a larger discussion on the typology of museums of modern art and how intertwined they were with the making of art and the politics of their day. Thanks very much. Another perspective of the issue of the museums, I would like to ask about the perspective of the visitor. So we know about the um, intentions of the owners, we know the intention of the collectors. Um, and um, what about the um, visitors? Have you encountered any um, reflections, any kind of the visitor evaluation um, of the visits? At those at, at the museums that you were talking uh, about, I know you mentioned um, um, both a bit um, what kind of atmosphere and what kind of impression the um, owners of the, those museums or the architects of those um, of the of the museum buildings wanted to evoke. But um, have you have you encountered any kind of uh, reflection of uh, the visitors, Marina? Uh, yes, yeah, thank you uh, very much for this interesting question, but I cannot answer it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because unfortunately, uh, we had to look at the visitor books, for example, um, to find uh, some um, uh, yeah, described uh, descriptions uh, for these um, uh, points in the museum to have a look at it. And I have no time uh, because Corona <laughs> to go to the museums and uh, have a look at the visitor books, um, but I will do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we will be very interested to, 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 to hear about them, to, 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 to know these, um, to get to know these opinions. And Laurie, have you had any opportunity to, to delve into such uh, <laughs> reflections? No, I think it's a, it's a great question, especially because um, because of the sort of irony. I don't know if it's an irony, but there, you know, the, the 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 socialists that were involved in these reform programs were were um, extremely earnest and made a huge difference in terms of their, their designs. But they they themselves came from they 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 not only came from elite backgrounds but they were their work was supported by mm -hmm. you know the aristocracy uh, so it was a kind of a bubble. Mm -hmm. um, nonetheless, there is actually currently a, a really lovely exhibition on display at the Kunstmuseum Den Haag, which has um, photographs and they also have a publication along with the exhibition, which has photographs of visitors in the museum. Uh, during the opening. And one of their um, really strong initiatives was education. And um, Van Gelder from the get-go uh, went to schools um, and he had really done research on museum education um, with some German scholars, as well as with, um, among some American scholars about museum education. And he brought school children into the museum. And so there, they were sort of really um, at the forefront of um, museum education in, in the galleries. And there are some wonderful photographs um, of that time. I think with the, I don't have information about the Kroller Museum, and that's kind of the latest of the museums that I'm I'm investigating. But I will take your question to heart, certainly. But but with the Stedelijk Museum, it was a little more complicated because there was a lot of tension between the the sort of avant-garde efforts and the the sort of local population. There there were efforts at internationalizing the museum, but the the local artist circles were were not there. We're not part of that 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 community yet. So it was um, it, it, it was it, it was strained. Um, and and the directors had some strained relationships uh, with the community, even though the Amsterdam um, municipal government supported them. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. And do you think that uh, the visitors um, could have any kind of influence on the owners when it comes to um, 
acquisitions or the arrangement or any kind of, I don't know, changes within those museums? Could there be any kind of this relationship between the visitor and, and the owner? We're <laughs> just, 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 just thinking about um, the visitor as an agent of change, the thing that we are so much talking about now today, but could, could, could there be any kind of um, agency in terms of the visitor um, at that time when it comes, for example, to acquisition? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, I, I think both Berlage, uh, both the Kunstmuseum and the Stedelijk Museum really cared about the community. They wanted to bring them through the doors. They, they didn't care so much. Um, they didn't want their museums to be sort of temples of, of learning. They wanted to be places of community engagement. Um, but I, I don't know what influence the, 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 the public had on acquisitions. And as a former museum curator, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, it, it's, it, you know, money talks and the, you know, it, it just does. And, 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 you know, who owns it gets to make the decisions. Um, yeah. Even though we live and work in an environment in these past 10 years where, you know, multivocality in terms of curating is, is, is very much um, au courant as, as mm -hmm. I believe it should be. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, thank you. We, we have some questions um, to Lori. How far were the exhibitions of those museums rehanged, rechanged during the German occupation? Um, and the second question also to Laurie, did the museums in The Hague and Stedelijk exhibit um, Entartete Kunst by artists expelled in the Third Reich during 1933, 1940 uh, before the German occupation? Well, it's in, I think they tried, you know, I think that 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 uh, Sandberg, um, they supported them. And I think at, at the beginning, they they had small, this is as much as I know, and, and this is a beginning research project. So I'm sorry, I don't have full answers. Um, but, but they did support um, German artists who had to flee. Um, but by the occupation, they certainly couldn't. They certainly couldn't. But they were. They did. They tr did try to negotiate the the culture camera, and they would sort of um, stage uh, kind of vaguely patriotic exhibitions about the Netherlands, um, inserting uh, contemporary avant-garde art. But they they. They couldn't really display the, um, the entre art by, by then. It was impossible. And by 1942, Sandberg, um, the curator, was in hiding um, because his colleagues, um, it, it, he was part of a, a group of um, intellectuals who stormed the uh, city records office in Amsterdam burning it up so that the Germans couldn't find the documents of, of those they wanted and created false. They did, but they helped them. I mean, they created false do documents for German artists as well as German Jews. So they helped them as much as they could, but they, they were not in a position. To Laurie, of course, but my question was, uh, was devoted to the period before the German occupation of the Netherlands, when, for example, Beckmann was in, in uh, Netherlands and few others. So this was the period between, let's Let's say 35 and 1940 and right. not afterwards so, for, so for in the time of German occupation that's obvious but before the in 1935 when when Sandberg became curator and 19, 1939 as far as I know no but I know that Beckmann was in Holland they were involved they were because also but I need to do more research and I will, um, because it's a very, very important question. Um, but their emphasis at the time was really, they were working with local artists and they were working with Paris. Um, and they were sort of working with the Parisian avant-garde and introducing it uh, to, to Holland. So how and when the, um, the German artists who had sort of escaped into, I, I don't know that exhibition history and I, I will um, explore it. 
So that's as far as I can go Thank right you. now. Thank you. For and what time. about rehanging in during the, the, the when, when the museums were open? Because you said that they were, of course, not confiscated. That there was something different than, for example, in France with or with Jewish property, uh, private Jewish property or private property. But what about rehanging? Well, what they they were rehanging. I mean, they were what they were doing was experimenting with hanging. They were experimenting. They, that what they wanted to do, but I mean, separate from um, the looming World War II, um, and that's really my interest, and it, it's all my interest. But I'm interested in this transform, this transition from the old museum to the modern museum, and what they were doing, and and they the, just the repainting of the walls was a different exhibition strategy. That, um, but but that's as really as far as they were able to go um, during in in terms of installations. Are you talking about rotating works of art and putting no, different? I, ones I was in? thinking more about let's say the pressure of the Germans during the German occupation because you said that they did not touch let's say this this connect collections, but did they make a kind of pressure to rehang them? So I mean, just to to take the modern art, or at least part of them, for example, of the Jewish artists, of the Ju 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 of the German artists, of the modern artists, because of course the Antarctica Kunst, this was not the the mm, grief which one used in the Netherlands. But anyhow, was it a kind of pressure? It was indeed a pressure, and Sandberg and, and Sandberg hid a lot of the Jewish art collections. I mean, he physically put them in his bunker. Um, I don't know, and again, it's a good question. I'm really thankful for your questions. I don't know if he also hid the German artist's work, um, and that would be an interesting question to pursue. But they, they really were negotiating this, this fine line about how, how far they could go. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have one more question to Marina. You showed us um, some very nice images of uh, reconstructions of interiors of the Städel in Frankfurt. Could you tell us more about it? Is it some part, some kind of, is it, is it part of a, some kind of a project or what was it exactly? And why was it done? Uh, yes, um, this was a project from the Städel Museum. Uh, um, and they reconstruct the rooms for every um, um, building. Um, where the um, the collection from Friedrich Stedel was, and and they make it uh, about uh, the sources, um, about the inventories, and so on. And um, it's a very nice three uh, D model, and you can see uh, every room and have a look at uh, every site, um, and uh, can um, see uh, which uh, pictures uh, were on the. Um, on every side uh, mm -hmm. in the room. I see. And just oh. for every, uh, and it, it will be um, three or four um, situations uh, about the time uh, they were hanging in this um, uh, in these houses. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they are doing it based on the documentation that is kept at uh, the museum, right? Yes, yes. Black and white photos and and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much.